Hello. Welcome to Autistic Counter Stories. In this podcast, we celebrate and affirm the diverse perspectives of autistic people, informed by research developments and lived experiences. We don't aim to represent every experience in this series. We also don't want to tell stories that try to explain away differences or lump together people's diverse experiences. Rather, we want to present you with a selection of counter stories to dispel myths and counter oppressive narratives and honor the diversity of autistic lives. One more thing. In this podcast, you'll hear very little from our show's producers. We'd like you to experience these stories in people's own words, writing, and music so that their experience stands alone and reflects the wonderful variety of neurodivergence. Today, we're taking a look at late diagnosis, the validity of self-diagnosis, and the intersection of autism, race, and gender. Many autistic people know that they're autistic before receiving a formal diagnosis, a process that's often frustrated by stereotypes, racial disparities, cost, and diagnostic gatekeepers. In this episode, you'll hear from three people who found out they were autistic later in life. Eamon, Leila, and Silke. very sensitive uh, to noises, to smell, to, to, to clothes. So actually, I, I'm sensitive to, to anything. So <laughs> um, uh, to light, whatever, um, you can name anything and, and I will be sensitive to it. So I was talking about my sensitivity issues, uh, especially to noise. And then she asked me about my family history. And I all, uh, yeah, I, I got nervous because I knew, okay, if we are going to talk about family, there's a, yeah, there is a chance that it, <laughs> it will go wrong. And then I thought, no, you have to give it a chance. Now you're the one who's stereotyped. Now you're the one who's biased. You have to give it a chance. So she, she asked me how many brothers and sisters do you have? And I said that we were uh, with, with uh, six children at home. So I have uh, three sisters and two brothers. And then she immediate, immediately reacted like uh, she said, oh, yeah, OK, but uh, a family of eight, of course, you're sensitive to noise. There's a lot of noise at your home. And so, yeah, I thought, OK, here we go again. My name is Iman. I'm a cultural sociologist. And I'm specifically interested in the relationship between culture and inequality. I mainly yeah, study how Things like cultural categorizations result in ethnic inequality, mostly, but also other forms of inequality, gender inequality, and so on. We know from research that there are a lot of ethnic and racial disparities in the field of autism. So people of ethnic or racial minorities are much less likely to be diagnosed as autistic. They are generally diagnosed at a later age. They appear to have a more severe clinical profile, like uh, higher rates of intellectual disabilities, to give just one example. And yeah, they make less use of social services. Most of the research is really focused on factors related to the family side. So mainly, most scholars really look at how minority families, ethnic or racial minority families, make sense of autism, how autism is perceived among their communities. And what I was interested in as a cultural sociologist and what appeared to be relatively underexposed is yeah, how we perceive autism as a society. Little is known about the impact of public representations of autism how autism is portrayed in pop culture, uh, but also in autism research, what people know about autism and what people imagine when they think about an autistic individual. Analysis of, let's say, uh, TV shows or films uh, show that most autistic characters on TV or in pop culture in general are mostly male and middle class. But what remains, yeah, less discussed is how um, the, those people are also mainly white. When we imagine an autistic person, 
most people think about a little white boy or even an older white man who is obsessed with building planes with yeah, specific plane models. I don't know how they say it in English. Good in mathematics. We also see in pop culture, like yeah, films that autistic white men are often presented as highly intelligent in some ways, like in hard sciences, but that they are socially not really adapted. But when I read books about autism among girls or among women, then I'm also confronted with very narrow perceptions or, or representations, like they try to challenge the stereotypes of the autistic male. But then I really see that they present autistic girls like very creative, um, that they enjoy reading all classic novels already at age of nine, eight, ten years old, that they love horses. It's also, I think, one of the cliches about women and or girls and autism, that they learn themselves to play piano. But yeah, when I read those things, I think, okay, interesting. So they try to um, challenge the stereotype of the male autistic man who excels in, in, in hard sciences. But the autistic girl is apparently always middle class or even upper middle class. It's really related to white middle class, upper middle class characteristics or hobbies or lifestyle. When I read those things, it's hard to imagine an autistic boy or girl from a lower class family or for ethnic racial minority, let alone if all those different identities intersect. So, and yeah, when I talk to people um, about these topics, I also notice that they find it very difficult to, to imagine how, how, yeah, what are the characteristics of an autistic girl or an autistic boy in a lower class family? who doesn't have all those things at home that are referred to when describing in books, when describing the behavior or, or yeah, the characteristics of autistic children. So the attributes, when they are not there, how, to, how can we understand autism? And I think that the literature says very little about that at this point. We need more research, but I expect to find in my research, it is also quite difficult for practitioners to recognize autism when those characteristics are not very present. Because, of course, practitioners are trained, but they are not always, they're not free from biases. Recording this. I'm gonna try and switch this on. Sorry, I don't know if you guys hear. I'm gonna try to switch well. that off. Yeah, sorry. Um, I get distracted easily. <laughs> um, so yeah, hi, I'm Leila, and I live in the Netherlands in Amsterdam. Um, I'm originally from South Africa. I was born there, and I'm 39. I was officially diagnosed with autism um, last year. But I already knew about three years and I was already uh, getting help from a coach, which I found myself the second time that I went for the diagnosis. I went to someone who would tell me, okay, it's not autism, but it is this because I've had so many issues and so many things. And I've had a lot of periods that went good in my life. Uh, but it, the times that it went bad, it was always the same thing. And it wasn't always just depression it was also other things and it was actually my husband that uh, saw autism in me which I basically ignored for a couple of years because I thought it was the most ridiculous thing he had ever said and um, it was only until I read about how we now know that um, it comes up in women um, that I I read an article about this and it was as if the whole entire article was about me. And I just wept. I was alone at home. Uh, I can still remember the day. And I just wept because everything in that article, and trust me, I searched like literally every article after that I could find. And it was just all about me. Um, 
certainty for me is everything. Um, so I just needed to know. I needed to know, okay, and if it's not, then what? what is it? Uh, that was really important for me. And um, when other people talk about self-diagnosis, I 100% accept it. Um, I don't think anyone would just say for fun, oh, I'm autistic. I think the people that are autistic have done so much research on the subject. Not like you wake up and you say, oh, I'm autistic. That's fun, you know, I can use the hashtag now. It doesn't work that way. So I think uh, self-diagnosis is valid. But for me, it wasn't enough. It made I was too insecure. So I really needed the certainty. You mentioned hashtag. Um, you know, it's not just a hashtag. And uh, there is so much behind that. I saw your Instagram account. You can maybe tell us what's on your Insta profile and why you feel it's important to formulate it as, as such. Yeah, so on my Instagram profile, I think it says uh, proud autistic. Uh, Muslim woman of color. <laughs> For me, you know, my, my diagnosis was very freeing. Um, and it was in a certain way empowering because it, it was a, I realized, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm not less of a human, which I felt for a long time in my life. Uh, I felt as if I just couldn't cut it, like, you know, like, like other people, even in my family. I felt like I was a bad copy. My diagnosis made me feel like I'm just different. I don't see autism as being something less. Um, I see it as being something more, especially even in the Netherlands and in Europe, you know, over the years. There's so many stigmas on autism, on being Muslim, on being... You know, a person of color, racism is up, Islamophobia has been up, you know, um, misogyny. It's already open, it's all, already out. And a lot of people think, might think you're less because of these things. And uh, I make it a point to say I'm not less because of these things. I'm more because of these things. And I think it's important that other women, other uh, Muslims, other autistic people can see, you know, it's something to be proud of, and we won't be shamed for being autistic. And I won't be shamed for being a woman. I won't be shamed for being Muslim. Yeah, and I, and also a lot of cultures don't really recognize autism as being something. Um, and it's something I, uh, since my diagnosis, I really want to speak up against and speak up about. So that's a, definitely a very important subject for me. Another thing is that for people of color, it's also uh, extra difficult to get the diagnosis, especially in women, uh, because the tools aren't written for us and about us. So that's in like an extra difficulty. And that's why the second time round, uh, I specifically went out to look uh, for a different organization and asked specifically, um, do you have people of color working there? Do you guys have the experience of working and diagnosing people of color? Um, because, uh, yeah, the first time it was all white, blonde women. And I'm not saying white, blonde women can't do their job right. But I didn't feel heard. I didn't feel like they uh, pushed through, you know, in autism, we call it masking. And, you know, you don't, if, if you've, been masking for what was it then I think 35 36 years and if masking is also something that happens um, in cultures a lot I'm sure you guys uh, you know know about certain cultures where it's it's normal you don't talk to people strangers or psychologists you know it's like almost a, a sin to do something like that um, so I think culturally, we learn a lot about masking. I think autistics uh, learn how to mask and add that up. You need someone good that, that is aware of that and that can uh, see past that. And I think because uh, they were not culturally sensitive, that they missed a lot of things in my diagnosis. And, and that hurts me because, you know, it, it, it did so much damage to me for them to say, uh, well, we can't give you the diagnosis. 
it uh, really did a lot to me personally. And even now, you know, I get sometimes um, people of color or Muslims and they say, I, I have no idea where to go. It is difficult knowing that for certain people, it's more difficult to get the diagnosis. And that you know that the system is, you know, sort of broke. It has cracks, let me say it like that. Um, and we're not fixing it yet. So that's, yeah, that's painful. It's painful. There is some research that shows that ethnic minority uh, or racial minority autistic people are misdiagnosed as a result of prejudices and stereotypes and biases. There was a Dutch study. It examined ethnic biases and it presented vignettes to practitioners in the Netherlands. So they were presented with vignettes describing exactly the same behavior, but some vignettes refer to an ethnic majority child and some to an ethnic minority child. And that showed that indeed when a vignette refers to an ethnic minority child, the practitioners were much less likely to foreground autism as potential factor for the behavior described, although there were no differences between both vignettes. So I want to understand the reasons for those biases in the assessments and how both perceptions of minorities, but also of autism and how we imagine autism, how they are both present. This, of course, would be a logical seg into asking you a more personal question because you were somehow confronted with that bias as well. Yeah. Would you want to share something about that sort of yeah. how you came to that? I'll try. Myself, I have, I have had a very difficult childhood and youth, especially at school. So I, yeah, I was confronted with a lot of difficulties when it comes to social interaction, when it comes to structure, it went totally wrong in secondary. I dropped out of school at, uh, yeah, early without qualification. And then I went to higher education eventually. And yeah, now I'm having my PhD. And so with that difficult trajectory, um, always bothered me. And I always was trying to understand it. Because of the family history, the, the, the confrontation with stereotyped and biased view among practitioners throughout my life, but also the, the social mobility. I have a Moroccan background. My parents are from Morocco. So that really encouraged me to, to, to conduct even more research. And then I discovered uh, the, the racial disparities, the ethnic disparities that I described earlier. So when I was researching the, the behavior, uh, behavioral characteristics or adjusted characteristics as described in the DSM, which is a diagnostic and statistical manual of mental disorders. Yeah, I could really relate to the criteria, which are very yeah, broad, actually described. But when I was researching experiences, for instance, or how those criteria are reflected in everyday life, in how people interact, in how people behave, it was more difficult, like I said earlier, because it's those, it's like those experiences really assume that people have a middle class background and are white. We were not middle class at home, but because of the trajectory, of course, let's say the environment I'm now is, is very different. So yeah, <laughs> I'm an academic. So um, my university environment is of course middle class, at least middle class. So of course, because of the social mobility, the upward mobility that I have experienced, I could relate to some of the experiences. At the same time, I knew, okay, but I wouldn't be able to relate to this. I, I wouldn't relate to this at all when I was younger, when I was a teenager, when I was a child. So the only reason why I'm very able to, to relate to at least some of the experiences is because of that upward mobility. Take 
some time to to mm -hmm. read if you want and in the meantime see the door is open maybe we close uh, yeah my cat uh, <laughs> he, but it's, join in, it's but probably can, better he if he's can. here because yeah, yeah, uh, otherwise he's gonna be moaning outside. that's perfect but i'll close the door cat sounds are perfectly okay <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, he usually wants to be a part of whatever I'm doing. Come up. Come here, you sit with I'll record a bit of meowing, that's always nice. Yes. I was very relieved to indeed finally receive my diagnosis because I have always been strange in some ways, mainly in my thinking. I realized I was strange and for some reason to be strange without having any idea why made me feel very anxious and embarrassed as well. Embarrassed about, for example, getting straight A's in school but not understanding social rules that seemed so utterly simple to almost everyone else. Or embarrassed for being obsessed with the organization of my space and my days without understanding why this seemed to be so important to me more than to most others. And especially as a young adult, suddenly a lot is expected of you. While a lot of the mundane tasks like grocery shopping or even taking the bike in a city would cause me so much stress that I eventually had to be hospitalized at 20 years of age. And it took another 10 years for someone to come with the right diagnosis, unfortunately. So yes, it was a huge relief to finally understand the way my brain is wired, because that's what it is, what it means to me, at least, to receive a diagnosis. And to realize that there's a lot of people, even though it's a minority, a lot of people that are similarly wired that I connect, can connect with and share experiences with, and that I no longer have to feel embarrassed and guilty for not managing life in the way that people who are not autistic or in another way disabled do. So I would say for me, a timely diagnosis would have been at least a decade prior to the date that I finally got one in order for me to get the support that I needed. And probably even in my early to late teens. I must also stress that even when I had my diagnosis, there were a lot of times where I would start to doubt this diagnosis. Like, is this, because, you know, I have more or less managed to function in neurotypical society. I've, you know, I'm self-supporting. I have a job, although it's a part-time job and I've tried a full-time job and it's basically not possible to manage that. But at least, you know, there's some ways I managed to function and to even come across as a, as a neurotypical person because that's what you learn to do in order to survive. Um, so, yeah, there have been a lot of moments where I started to question whether this diagnosis, am I really autistic? Or when I read the work of people who are nonverbal or I hear of people with autism who are challenged in ways that I can't say that I have been as seriously as they have been, you start to doubt these diagnoses. And what always, like, sort of helped to um to anchor me in like these moments of questioning myself is return to groups that actually consist of people with autism and talking to them and then there's no way that I doubt that I am on the spectrum because there's so there's so much recognition and there's so much homecoming in that experience that my sense of diagnosis lays more in community than it is actually coming from this official record. Although, of course, it's important to state that this official documentation that I have opens doors to support that you otherwise just are denied access to, from. So it's um, complex. But I, for example, can also only imagine what it's like to be, for example, um, part of another minority, 
let's say you're a person of color and where I got assessed, this is a very wide environment which, which comes with their own bias. And on top of that, these assessments, these um, diagnostic processes are quite expensive. There are options to have them done in public hospitals, I believe, but there's then there's the issue of waiting lists, which can take up years for you to be able to get a spot. In the first episode, we want to reflect a little bit on the the meaning and timing of diagnosis, formal diagnosis, as opposed to self-diagnosis. I don't know if you even think that distinction is actually relevant. So I think a formal diagnosis is, of course, very, very important in many ways. I think especially for children in schools, for employees, for whatever, um, because, of course, it provides access to social services. And at some points, I think, okay, I perhaps I should get a formal diagnosis, for instance, for colleagues to understand why I can't work at the office, that I'm not an arrogant social uh, researcher, but that, that I'm just very uh, overstimulated all the time when I go outside. But I'm not seeking a formal diagnosis at, at this moment. I think for many reasons, like I, I have a very, yeah, I have a very good job at this moment. I can work at home. So at this moment, there's no need for it. But that's one part of the story. And the other part of the story is, of course, I don't want to be confronted with the stereotypes and biases among many practitioners, which again is a very stereotype perception of myself, of course. But I have too many negative experiences that it's not worth it for me. It's not worth the symbolic violence to go through such a diagnosis. I know some ethnic minority people, also of Moroccan ethnic backgrounds, who received formal diagnosis and who also said that it was a quite difficult process with a lot of symbolic violence, that they were indeed confronted with some stereotypes which they had to navigate in order to to, to be heard as an individual, as a person, and not only as an illustration or as an uh, yeah, outcome of a certain ethnic culture. Ethnic minorities are not only extremely underrepresented in autism research as respondents, or as target groups to say it like that, but ethnic minority or racial minority autism researchers are are also extremely underrepresented. I think that those experiences are necessary if we want to conduct research on this topic. And the major gap in the literature now is probably also because of the lack of representation among researchers as well. Thank you for listening to Autistic Counter Stories. This three part podcast series is commissioned by the Autism Ethics Network at the University of Antwerp with funds from Research Foundation Flanders. Elena de Kamitis is creative lead and executive producer of the series. Dieter de Klerk is co producer, academic liaison, and lead editor. Louis Dunlop Marriott is assistant producer. The podcast music was composed by Bram Verhaga from Studio de Nook. The voiceover was written by my dear friend M and read by me, Ada Rose. Researchers from the Autism Ethics Network have offered invaluable guidance on the concept of autistic counter stories. Finally, a special word of thanks goes to the people who let us into their lives and allowed us to share their stories with you. Thank you, Imen, Leila, and Silke. We want autistic counter stories to reach as many people as possible. If you want to support us, please share this podcast with others, post about it on social media, or leave a review. If you have any questions or feedback, please send us an email. Contact details and a full list of people we wish to thank are included in the show notes. We'd love to hear from you.